Howdy folks. Welcome to the Rafter K Rustics Workshop. You know, I think I got a pretty fun one in store for you today. If you're like me, you do a good bit of woodwork and you're gonna have some little scraps of wood left over. They're too small to do much with and I really hate to throw them away. So I'm always looking for something new and fun to do with them. Especially if it's a pretty piece of wood. And, and one of the things I've gotten to where I do like to do is make fishing lures out of them. Now when I make fishing lures out of these things, one of the things I think is kind of fun is to use the natural color of the wood to try to mimic the color of the of a baby game fish. Uh, like this one perhaps. I, I carved this one to look like a baby goliath grouper. It's got a jointed body. Has this little paddle tail that I kind of hoping to would make for an erratic kind of up and down bouncy action. Now, I can see you guys got the wheels turning in your head. You're thinking, what the hell? How is this guy going to show us how he made the lure if he's holding it at his hand at the start of the video? What sorcery is this? Burn him at the stake! It is magical, my friends. And if Hollywood ever figures out how I did it, we're all in big trouble. Now, there's a lot of guys out there on YouTube that are making lures. And to me, the best one, the funnest one, is Marling Bates. I'm going to leave a link, by the way, to his channel in the description because the guy is really fun to watch. He's a, an amazing artist. And uh, he's also got all the specialty tools that you need if you're going to make lures on a regular basis. He's got the lead pot. He's got a lathe. He's got, he's got uh, molds. He, he does a good bit of molding plastics. And he's got an airbrush, and, and I want to tell you the truth, this guy is just a stud with an airbrush, and he's fun to watch. But let's be real, most of us are not that artistic. We don't have all of the tools and or even the desire to spend the money on the tools to do the things that he does. And if you're like me, you don't have the patience to learn how to do it the way he does it. I'll be honest with you, I couldn't draw a decent fish with a wad of Catfish Charlie. I don't care to spend the money on a lead pot, so I just use fishing weights and kind of make them fit in the holes. And I'm not ever going to learn how to use an airbrush the way that guy does, and I don't want to spend the money on it. Besides, it kind of more fits the stuff I do in my shop to use the natural color of the wood to try and mimic the color of the game fish. Now, I admit that limits me. It's hard for me to do much in blue or chartreuse, but. You know, if you look, I make cutting boards and other stuff, and I end up with some reds and purples and and uh, a little bit of green from poplar. And in the case of this one, I used olive burl, and it was left over from a uh, a desk that I made. In fact, here's a picture of it. If you ever are in the Fullerton area, you can go to Blankwell Popular Art and see it. It's on display there with some of the other stuff I've made. Oh, you know, by the way, before we get into it, just one other thing. Instead of talking you through the process and saying, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm going to do this kind of different. It's something I've never seen really done on YouTube before, and it's either a dumb idea or it's very creative and innovative, and it'll be fun for you. So what I'm going to do is I'll make comments along the way where I need to, but for a good bit of what I'm going to do is read to you uh, a story from my misspent youth as a fisherman. Hell, if nothing else, if the reason that I've never seen it done on YouTube before is because it's a dumb idea, you could save me a lot of future embarrassment by letting me know. Either way, if you like it or don't, I'd appreciate the comments. So, uh, yeah, like I said, either way, thanks, pal. So I got a picture of a Goliath grouper off the internet and glued it onto my little piece of olive burl. And I'll tell you what, it the color of the fish and the color of the wood go together so well that it was an easy choice to make. 
An old friend called the other night. I'm ashamed to say that I hadn't talked to him in years. But just that rare kind of friend that you can rec reconnect with after a long time and not miss a beat. We talked about growing up together and he mentioned a photo I'd off but forgotten. In the photo is a boy sitting in a skiff holding up a stringer of white bass. The huge grin has a gap or two where the teeth are missing and he's wearing one of those old school orange life preservers and a white t-shirt on his head because he lost his beanie cap and it's a chilly day. I look in the mirror this morning and I wonder whatever happened to that kid. He was in such a hurry to grow up and now he'd love nothing more than to troll around Moss Creek Lake with his dad and his uncle Walt just one more time. That was a trip that almost didn't happen twice. When we were loading up our sleeping bags and fishing tackle and stuff, the trailer door slammed on my right thumb. My older brother, Jim, who had this amazing ability to keep his cool when I got hurt, looked at it, threw up a little in the back of his throat and said, it's just a scratch, you'll be fine. Don't show it to mom or she might not let you. Too late. I'd looked at it and I was already demonstrating the Doppler effect as I flew to the house. It never ceases to amaze me how fast a mortally wounded kid can run. It was almost, well it was Friday afternoon. But somehow my mom got me in to see the doctor and Dr. Terry gave me a tetanus shot just to punish me for being careless and wrapped up the thumb. He probably had a big shipment coming in Monday because I think he used all the gauze he had left in the warehouse to cover the wound. He held it on with a couple of rolls of white tape. When I finally held my hand up, it looked like Fred Flintstone had hit my thumb with a hammer. By Sunday, the bandage had come off and I again had full use of the hand, but the nail became one of many sacrificed to the altar of boyhood. By the way, you know, you can always use one of those fancy schmancy belt disc combo sanders, but I found that for shaping these things, my little belt sander does just a fine job. The second roadblock to the trip was a weather report. A front was coming in and it was going to be cold and windy. That was one of two weather reports I remember from Midland, Texas. It was always either cold and windy or hot and windy. The job of the weatherman was pretty simple. Hot or cold we could figure out for ourselves but we needed someone to tell us what size pebbles would be flying through the air. A guy in a cheap suit and a hard hat would go outside carrying screen boxes with different sizes of mesh. One at a time, in order from smallest to largest, he'd hold them up in the wind until one came back with no rocks in it. On a single knot day, it was best just to stay inside. As a kid who had a punch card for amoxicillin, buy nine earaches, the tenth one is free, my parents were not going to let me go out without my beanie cap. Now I'd slept several times since I'd used it, and even though I tore up the entire house, it was nowhere to be found. There was no way on earth they were going to drive me to Gibson's and spend my dad's hard-earned cash on a new one. The t-shirt on the head was a compromise that not only kept my ears warm, but it punished me for losing the cap. That's what we call a win-win in any parental record book. I will say that olive burl is kind of an interesting wood to carve. It doesn't really have grains, as a burl wood doesn't. And, and so what happens is you don't get the really clean slivers that you get with normal wood. But you also don't get chunks torn out either. So it's goods and bads. I learned book stuff at Emerson Elementary and other facilities in the Midland Independent School District Correctional System. But a lot of the really important schooling happened at the Moss Creek campus, just outside of Big Spring. I learned to fish, and in the early years, to catch fish and take them off the hook. In the 70s, something happened to the lake, and I learned to fish for hours without catching anything. We fished a lot in the bios and in the Gulf in southern Mississippi, 
and it was hard to learn not to catch fish there. My kids have never appreciated my ability to fish for hours without a bite, but living in Southern California, I've honed that skill into an art form. Without it, my fishing career would be all but over. Uncle Walt, who's Jeff's dad, taught us that some lures are designed to catch fish and some are meant to catch fishermen. I never understood the value of that lesson, but he had one lure in his tackle box that looked like a small Budweiser can and another that was a very scantily clad mermaid. They were my favorites, but we never got to fish with them. Well, here's the first blood spot on the lure. I guess I haven't really carved until I've slipped and let the knife go into my finger. Well, at least I didn't cry and I didn't cuss too loud and I didn't scare the kids or the neighbors, so I guess that's not too bad. So here I'll finish doing the uh, the gill detail in the face and then we'll move on to doing some more shaping to the body. We learned to hunt coyotes on the other side of the dam. Uncle Walt would take us, his 22, a spotlight and a wounded rabbit call and we'd sit in the dark and listen to the coyotes howl in the distance. I don't recall them ever coming near us, but we learned that hunting isn't in the shooting, it's in the being there. We endured our first duck hunts down on the end of the lake away from the dam. We learned that duck hunting is a terrible thing to do to a kid. Why my dad and Uncle Walt let us beg them into taking us over and over again, I'll never know. I guess there was no such thing as CPS back then. It was cold and wet and you had to get up awfully early to do it. When Jim shot his first duck, we learned that if you have an infestation of cockroaches, mice, or relatives that have outstayed their welcome, you can clear it up by putting a coot in a hot oven. Working on getting the, uh, the fins kind of rough shaped out, you notice I'm not going to do the, like, what do they call them, the pectoral fins, the ones on his front belly. Uh, not until after the other stuff's done because they get kind of fragile and I've broken them off enough times that they'll wait till the last. We learned how to drive a skiff at Moss Creek too. When we were mature and ready to accept the responsibility, my dad would stay on the bank and let us take the boat. I'm sure the idea of letting a couple of preteen kids take out the boat alone was a little stressful, but my dad grew up in Mississippi and he never learned how to fish for hours without a bite. No man wants to have his kids see him out of his element. One day some boys on the far bank threw rocks at us as we were trolling by. We went over by the dam, loaded up a bunch of rocks, and then went back to the scene of the attack. We waited just out of their range until they had used up all the ammo in their hands. When they bent over to get more, we charged in and unloaded on them. This may have been the first recorded prototype of a drive-by shooting. You're welcome, Los Angeles. From that little escapade, we learned that just because my dad was sitting on the bank with a cigarette and a cold beer, didn't mean that he wasn't watching what the hell we were up to. A few minutes later, he also taught us to fish from the bank for the rest of the trip. Then I'll do a little bit of the finished sanding on it. I know what you're thinking. Dang, what is he, a tweaker or something? Jeez, that hand goes fast when he sands. 
Well, it's a skill you develop, guys. This is one of the scarier parts to it is when you gotta finish making the cut uh, to make the joint. Got that dream that it's gonna cut right down to the middle and, and be symmetrical. And eh, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but it did come out pretty dang close. Take a little bit of sanding, a little bit of cleaning up, but it came out pretty good. And normally when you drill the weight hole on a lure, the easiest way to do it is to do it on the belly. And you want the weight on the bottom because it keeps the, the lure upright like it's supposed to be. In this case, it's a pretty big lure and the wood is not really dense. So I thought maybe the better way would be to drill the hole for the weight into the joint. Or in, kind of horizontally instead of vertically on the body and then to plug the hole I just made a dowel out of that same olive burl I start by kind of roughing it up with the belt sander and then I'm going to take it over to the drill press and use the drill press as a lathe to make it perfectly round and so that it fits exactly into the hole Later, my mom taught us how to sail on the lake. Sailing wasn't really my dad's thing, but my mom was pretty good at it. My clearest memory of sailing on Moss Creek was a hot, nodly, windless day. We were floating out in the middle of the lake, the sails hanging uselessly. We'd gotten up early that morning, while I could sit with a fishing rod for hours, sitting without one was tough. I laid down on the deck of the boat and fell asleep. Suddenly, a gust of wind blew up. The sails filled and the boat took off. Jim, my mom, and my sister Diane leaned into the hiking straps, and I rolled off the deck into the lake. I woke up underwater, struggling to swim to the surface. I couldn't figure out why the life jacket was trying to pull me to the bottom. We fought each other for what seemed like a half hour or so, and then I figured out the problem. Good thing, because my little lungs could only hold their breath for so long. So we got the lure in pieces. I'm going to go ahead and put the first couple of coats of automotive clear coat on it. Um, once it's jointed together, it's kind of hard to get the, the clear coat back up in some of the crevices. I haven't found the stainless steel wire locally, so I buy it from Cabela's. Now normally I just use a single strand, but since this is a big old heavy saltwater lure, I thought I'd try doubling the strands. <clears throat> Not so much to make the wire stronger so it doesn't break, but as you'll see when I twist it up, I use the twist to help hold the line ties, the hook eyes, and the joints for the uh, jointed bait into the wood. And I figured that by doubling it, it would strengthen those attachments and make it less likely to get busted in half if, if a big fish hits. Sadly, my kids didn't have a Moss Creek growing up. We had some great times. We went skiing and surfing, we went fishing and hunting pigs and backpacking. One time we even rented a houseboat on Lake Shasta for a week. But they were involved in organized sports year round, so it was hard to get away. They did have a video game where you could see blips on a screen that represented fish. Every cast, the controller would shake as you reeled in yet another 12 pound bass. It didn't have a setting where you could cast for hours without a bite, though. They had other games where you did drive-by shootings, but none of them had a rock-throwing op option 
or a skiff with a nine and a half horsepower Johnson as a getaway vehicle. I never even thought to make them wear t-shirts on their heads while they played. You know what kids, I'm sorry. So I made the, the uh, holes for the tail section tight enough that you actually I put glue on them and then screw them in and they should hold really well. Unfortunately you can't screw in the ones on the other side because well, physics don't let you do that. So what I do is make the holes as tight as I could but still slide the, the two uh, connectors in and then use a lot of super glue to hold it in tight. The super glue probably is, tight, is stronger than the wood so I don't think that's going to be a problem. I get the eyes from a local fly tying store. You can get them online, Cabela's has them and I've gotten them there as well but I prefer to buy local when I can. These are really cool, they're 3 sixteenths they fit perfectly. I used a quarter inch Forstner bit to kind of make a seat form. Then I put some uh, some super glue in to hold them a little better. They are self adhesive, but it's not that strong. They'll really be held in place by six or seven coats of the automotive clear coat that go on next. And the final coat, I think this is going to do it. That's like six coats. Automotive clear coat. In there. In his mouth. And here's the finished lure. It really does kind of look like a Goliath grouper. The same wood also works really well for kelp bass. I've done a couple of the kelp bass lures here on the west coast. Well, normally when I finish a lure, I take it to the next door neighbor's pool and try it out and see how it's going to look. But they were home today, so instead I took it over to the city duck park. And I'll tell you, I was a little disappointed. It, it, it sank a little faster than I would like, but then again, it's going to be in salt water. So that may not be an issue. Because as you know, in salt water, things float more which is why seagulls can have a lower BMI than ducks. And if you doubt that, then you're doubting science. And doubting science is the kind of thing that someone who's beholden to the New World Order would do, even though I don't know what Hulk Hogan has to do with any of this. The second thing that someone like that would do is deny that they have anything to do with the New World Order, that it even exists. So, um, getting back to the lure, it didn't have quite the, uh, the action I was hoping for. It didn't jerk around as much. It did have kind of an up and down kind of that motion to it, but not as much as I'd like. So I think what I'm probably going to do is uh, tie a little bucktail for the rear treble hook. And that should give enough of a, of a motion to, to entice fish to bite. Well, thanks for watching. Hey, and one thing before I go, a lot of the fun in this for me is in the comments. My favorite ones are the ones where someone gives me a ration of crap for something stupid I said or did, and then I get to give them a ration of crap back. And then we both laugh, and at the end of the day, our days were better because we had some fun with each other. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but I don't take myself just real damn seriously and you shouldn't either so uh, if you're thinking if, if you want to make a comment don't think about it too much don't think before you type don't worry about the consequences you give me a ration i give you a ration we have a good time in the meantime until we do the next video thanks again for watching don't be afraid to share it and like it and, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't and uh Take care and have some fun.